Hey, everybody. Uh, got a great show today, you know, for a change. And this time, I mean it. It's a return visit from Michael Lewis because he's just so great, unlike uh, many of my guests. Uh, you know, let's face it. Michael, of course, uh, is a great journalist and author of many New York Times bestsellers, Liar's Poker, Moneyball, The Big Short. And last time we uh, talked, uh, we did about his latest, The Fifth Risk, which turns out was prophetic. Uh, the book looked at the transition between the Obama and Trump administrations and is a scathing indictment of Trump and his complete lack of interest in how the federal government works. It's about how he populated his government with just incompetent, craven, and just plain venal people who had no idea how the federal government worked. The title, The Fifth Risk, is about the catastrophe the government should be focusing on and, and isn't. And uh, in our first interview about nine months ago, uh, Michael noted that Trump had gotten rid of the Pandemic Response Office within the National Security Council, an office that the Obama administration had established. And since I had been in the Senate during Ebola, I commented on just how bad an idea that was. Point is uh, that it turns out that the Trump administration has uh, given Michael a lot of material uh, for his paperback, and I think you'll find our conversation fun and edifying, you know, for a change. A couple of things uh, to talk about uh, first, though. Uh, the $1,200 check that uh, 70 million Americans are supposed to get this week, as you probably know, uh, it's been delayed a few days by the president's insistence that his name appear on the memo line of the check so that you know that Donald Trump gave you 1200 bucks. It turns out that millions of checks are going to be delayed a few days longer. They're trying to figure out how this happened. The president's name was misspelled on about 40% of the checks. Evidently, it was uh, spelled with two M's for some reason. Uh, Jared Kushner had been in charge of getting those checks out, and uh, he's been uh, looking into what went wrong here. Preliminary finding is that a guy named Gus uh, made a mistake. Uh, that's, that's what we're hearing. Uh, not only that, but in 6% of the checks, the name Jared Kushner appeared on the memo line there, and uh, so they've taken Jared off that and putting him back in charge of the uh, Israeli Palestinian peace process. Uh, my friend David Mandel, with whom we did a podcast, and uh, who was executive producer of Veep for three seasons, posted an interesting question online. He asked if the president's name is going to be on the death certificates as well. Um, I'm in a bad mood. I uh, suppose that was bound to happen sooner or later. Uh, watching uh, the president's press conferences has done a number on my mental health. Um, a few days ago, I, I woke up with, with a migraine. I get migraines. I don't usually wake up with them. My medication didn't work. That usually works. And I had a full-blown migraine. I started to feel uh, flushed and uh, kind of dizzy and a little nauseous. And I was convinced I had, I had the virus, I had the COVID-19. Uh, Franny uh, suggested I go to the Minute Clinic across the street. And uh, I went there it's at, at the CVS. And I went in and I talked to the nurse practitioner who man's the Minute Clinic. And she said, well, you have to make an appointment. And I only had, it was an hour later. I went back home and started contemplating um, my death. I was just very convinced that, that this was it, and I was very sad, very, very sad, because I want to see my grandchildren grow up, and uh, I'd kind of planned to live for another 25 years or so, but I was resigned to it. 
And I uh, got my went over for my appointment, and uh, uh, she took my temperature. It was ninety eight point six, and uh, checked my lungs and everything. And at the end of it, she said, "You have a migraine. You have a migraine." And uh, I went, "Oh, oh, okay. I'm watching too much news." So. Uh, I've been trying to watch a little less. But, you know, my job is kind of to watch it, isn't it? So it's hard. A um, few other items. Uh, the governor of South Dakota, Christy Nome, is still refusing to put a stand-in-place order in her state despite having a COVID-19 hotspot in, in Sioux Falls. Over 500 employees of the Smithfield Pork Processing Plant in, in, in Sioux Falls have tested positive, and over 100 people they've come in contact have tested uh, positive as well. I don't know how many of you have ever been uh, to a pork processing plant. Uh, I have. Uh, Minnesota is the second largest producer of hogs. Now, I went to a, a hog processing plant uh very close to Sioux Falls. It was in southwestern Minnesota. And I'll tell you about it. I'll tell you about it because I doubt many of you have had this opportunity. I went um, in reverse. Uh, and let me explain that. The first thing I saw was the pork packaged for the supermarket. So the first thing I honed in on were uh, the St. Louis cut spare ribs because I love spare ribs. And I got hungry. I was immediately, I, I entered this pork processing factory, and the first thing, I get hungry. Then I stopped getting hungry. Uh, and I go in reverse, and uh, one of the things I see is uh, cleaning the intestines. And they do that, and they send uh, the intestines uh, to China where they use it for sausage casing. And boy, they got to clean it because that was not pleasant. Anyway, I go backward. The final thing I see is the first part of it, which is I see the hogs lined up to go in, and um, they all look exactly the same. They're like clones of each other, and that's, that's what you call finishing. They finish these hogs to specification. This is why all those St. Louis cut sparrows were almost exactly the same. So these hogs come in, they walk in and let in, and uh, they get into an elevator. The elevator door opens, they get, they get put in the elevator, and then the elevator goes down, and at the bottom of the elevator, they're, they're dead. They've been asphyxiated. And then they take them by their feet, hang them upside down, slit their throats, and they bleed out. And this kind of, this is the last thing I'm saying. And I turned to the, the manager of the plant had uh, had taken me on this tour, and I said, oh, boy, I'm so glad that they asphyxiate them before they, they do that. And he said... Yeah, they make us do that. Uh, it's a lot better when the heart's beating because they bleed out faster. So that was my that was my tour of of a pork. You get to do those things uh, when you're a senator, and uh, uh, these are hardworking people, and these are people who don't get paid a lot, and. Um, I, I know the one has died, and uh, I hope the governor uh, reverses her her stance. And uh, I know that the the mayor of Sioux Falls has uh, put a, a shelter in place order out wisely. Okay, uh, let's go to my conversation with Michael Lewis. It's a great one, uh, you know, for a change. And this time, I mean it. Okay, last time you are here, uh, we discussed your New York uh, Times bestseller, The Fifth Risk. And I've noticed that you're very good at explaining things. So why don't you tell us 
uh, what the book is about and explain the title, The Fifth Risk. Sure. The book looked at the Trump total indifference to running the federal government, which started with him firing his entire transition team. So no one ever got any kind of briefings about how the various agencies ran. And it, but it sort of framed the whole thing as a risk management enterprise, which is what it is, uh, among other things. The federal government has this big portfolio of existential risks that it manages, most of which the American public doesn't have to think about because they've got experts in the government who are thinking about it for them, like, say, a pandemic. The idea for the book came when I walked into the first agency that I visited. It was the Department of Energy and found there was this character who was known as the chief risk officer. His name was John McWilliams, and he'd become out of the financial sector. He'd worked at Goldman Sachs. He'd been an investor in, in the energy sector. And his job had been to come and sort of frame the risks that just the energy department, one department out of a dozen or so, had to deal with. And he'd come up with 138 of these things. So I said to him, look, <laughs> look, wow. no, no, one had ever, no one had ever talked to him. He'd spent, he'd spent the previous four years there doing this and, and had real effect on what they were doing in the place. But no one from the Trump administration had bothered to call him. And, and this is a department that was, among other things, like managing the nuclear arsenal. Yeah, that was, I'm sure was one of the risks is a loose nuke getting into something. Yeah, absolutely. Hand. Or loose nuclear material. But, I mean, it yeah. was – this was so – I mean, it was a, a year after Trump took office. I could walk in and talk to someone who managed the nuclear arsenal and be the first person he briefed uh, because no one had bothered to get the briefings. And so uh, anyway, John McWilliams, I said, look, I don't have time for all your risks. Give me your best five. And he said, let me think where the top five would be. And he said, loose nukes or nuclear, a nuclear bomb going off when it shouldn't was actually the, the first one. And the second, the second one was an attack, interesting, an attack on the electric grid. He said, he said mm -hmm. it's going on. Chinese, North Koreans, et cetera, or have been trying to fiddle with our electric grid. And if the power goes out in, you know, the Northeast for a month, it is a catastrophe. Three was the Iran nuclear deal falling apart. Um, <laughs> it, well, I know. And he said, you know, it, it, would, it, would just, it would just ratchet up the probability of nuclear war. And four, he said these missiles that the North Koreans are launching into the sea that everybody thinks is a joke, actually they've got some Ukrainian, new Ukrainian scientists who've moved there and they're just testing and it's getting better and better and better. And we're, we're monitoring that in our national labs. They're measuring what they're doing. So I said, what's the fifth? And he paused for a long time. And I thought, there's my story. The story is the risk you can't, you're not thinking about uh, because there's so many of them, you can't keep them all in, mo in mind. So it's basically about the risk that the federal government isn't preparing for properly. And let me ask you this. Um, do you think you have enough material for the paperback? <laughs> the paperback's out. Uh, I think I have enough material for another book. And in fact... It's going to be a different sort of book, but I think that it's just very hard not to write about what's going on because it's interesting in so many ways. If you look at the way the Trump administration has responded to the coronavirus, I mean, it's appalling. They've been really bad for the first couple of months in, in their response. But it isn't just this. I think there are a number of things that might have happened that they were equally unprepared for that we'll never know about because they didn't happen. This just happens to be the thing that happened. And what you're seeing is a little portrait of the Trump administration's management ability. You know, it's just being written by the pandemic as opposed to, I don't know, an attack on the electric grid or terrorist attacks or, you know, threats to the water supply or whatever else it is that, that they were supposedly managing and not managing. Have you been studying this one in particular? Yes, because I mean, I've been watching it closely and talking to doctors and epidemiologists and people in the government who or who were in the government who were in a position to man manage a response to the pandemic. And you can see that there was an early warning system that had been built and a management system that had been built. Going back to the Bush administration, there's a document that was written in 2005 and it was just like preparing for pandemic influenza. It really is sort of the playbook and it was updated by the Obama administration. In addition to that, the the Obama administration had put in a, a pandemic response team on the National Security Council that reported direct. It was in the White House. The National Security Advisor does not have to be confirmed by the Senate. The NSC is the president's deal. And the person that person can call the president. There are lots of different agencies that come into play when a, a disease is threatening to break out in the United States. It's not just the Center for Disease Control. 
It's Health and Human Services. It's the State Department. It's the Department of Transportation. Lots of different agencies are involved. And the idea was you need someone to manage this whole thing. So, so for example, when the Center for Disease Control swears it has a test that works and can get it out in time, you have a check on them. You aren't just trusting the Center for Disease Control, as they did. And Trump fired this entire pandemic response team on the NSC. On, on the NSC, he, he abolished this office. Th- that's right. To it, respond it, to pandemics, because he has, of course, blamed Obama, as he does for pretty much everything. When he was asked about disbanding this office, he said he didn't know about it. You know, that's convenient, right? Um I mean, his. I don't know. Is that good? <laughs> I mean, is that is that like you see? I didn't know about it. I didn't know about the pandemic group that we got if, rid if of. If he had spent just a little bit of the time that he spends tapping on his phone in the mornings and at night, paying attention to this enterprise he's meant to have been managing, he you're, might you're have saying been. he has a bad leadership style. You think I, I, uh, I ill suited for the presidency? Is that what you're? Is that what you're saying? That's one of the things I'm saying. It's worse than just a leadership style. His character is ill-suited to leadership. <laughs> there, there, there are things okay. about him, especially re- leadership in a crisis, that make him really bad at this. Is that the narcissism? Well, one of them is, like, he doesn't want bad news. He just he wants all everything to be good news, especially about him. And so anybody who brings to his attention a mistake he might have made or a mistake his administration made and needs to be corrected is likely to get their heads lopped off. So what does that mean? Nobody's willing to go tell him that he made a mistake or his administration made a mistake. So when they make a mistake, it doesn't get fixed. It festers. He has this thing. And I think, I mean, there are different ways of putting it. But it's been interesting to me, and this even predates his presidency, It's just like who he is. His whole life, he's had this capacity, this tendency to retell whatever happened, never mind the facts, in a way that's flattering to himself. So what's happened is he's developed this habit of he doesn't really care what happens. It's sort of like what happens is what he spins it as after. And I think that means that he creates a kind of psychological incentive not to pay very much attention to what happens because he's thinking all the time, what's the story I'm going to tell? That's what it feels like. It's like it's a reality show and we're living the reality. The American people are living the reality of this. But he can go pretty much the first two months and say it's no problem, right? And think about what that means because – What he did was he abdicated the responsibility of taking charge of this thing and left it to local leaders to do things like close the school systems. And much, much harder to do when you don't have the federal government giving you any kind of cover. If you don't have the president standing up and saying this is the right thing to do when it is clearly the right thing to do. And it's actually in the playbook. Um, But and instead sort of hedging it so that Look, if everybody's angry about the schools being closed, they won't blame him. They'll blame the local leader who, t- who was brave enough to do it. If it ends up working and, uh, and everybody sort of kind of says, ah, look, not as many people died as we thought, he can, he can say, but we're ir- and we're irritated how much was closed down. He can say, I didn't want to close it down in the first place. That's what he's thinking. But uh, if, we, if we're going to move ahead to the, uh, you know, say November, are people in November going to really buy what he's been saying? I know a certain percentage do, but as we see this horror, I can't see that sustaining. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, you never know what's going to happen, and you never know which way this thing is going to bounce. But it's kind of hard to imagine with the sums of money that are going to be thrown at the election by the likes of Michael Bloomberg and the video evidence of his mismanagement, it's kind of hard to believe people won't be reminded of it enough. So the question is, the people who support him, have they backed themselves into such a corner that changing their mind is like a a tantamount to changing their identity and they just don't want to do that. And I just don't know. You're talking really about what goes on inside the mind of someone who supported him so far. Well, I know that the senators who have supported him thus far 
are probably not changing. And you part think of that's that, true? You think that's true? You mean in the back of their minds? Or you know those people. You know those people. Do you think that those senators, uh, there's any part of them that thinks, man, I'm, I'm, I'm on the same team as the guy who's responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of Americans. Maybe I ought to think about my Oh, team. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're thinking that. They're just not saying it publicly at all. And they're not saying it privately to me. I have some friends who I thought were morally serious people. But when they did not vote for witnesses during the impeachment trial, I had to think twice about that. Uh, so I just don't know. I, and nobody knows what's going to happen in November. I know. Uh, nobody knows. I do. You do. Okay. You you know because you know everything, uh, which is why you need guests just for kind of like a springboard for your own thoughts. But nobody else knows. <laughs> All right, yeah, I don't know. Okay, I don't know. I admit it. It's a big man to admit he doesn't know everything. And now, what do you think, this whole thing about his view of the federal government, how insane is that? You know, there were lots of little anecdotes that were thrown at me when I was working on the book, and one of them that stuck in my mind was how shocked Jared Kushner was when all the people who were in the White House had left when they turned up. He thought everybody kind of stayed. He didn't realize how much <laughs> that's right. He, he didn't realize how much how ah. much there was to do. If you think about the way, the way Trump talks about the government, it's always just the deep state, right? It's not it's not this precious tool that could, is the only tool for dealing with a crisis like this or an enterprise filled with people who are giving blood, sweat and tears to their country because they love it. It's this deep state. It resonates, obviously, with his audience. But but because, as you know, the strange thing about our democracy is how shallow the state is that you you have when you're president 4000 plus people to appoint, uh, many of whom you need to get confirmed by the Senate in order to run the government. You run the government. You put your people in. And it's not this this body that's sort of alien to you. You have no control over much more so. This is much more true of our government than, the, say, the British government or the French government, where there is a civil service that sort of stays in place running things from administration to administration. And so he has far more control over this than the typical democratically elected leader does over his state. And yet he seems to regard it as basically not his problem. And running it is no big deal. Speaking of Jared... Uh, Jared became part of the task force, right? Or was an adjunct to it? And I, I've read that uh, he was kind of a distraction. They had to answer questions that Jared had. But I remember when he came out in the press conference and basically contradicted what some doctor had said, some mere well, doctor? Yeah, what, I think well, what, what the uh, what Tony Fauci had said. I think it was Fauci or, or what the models, he doubted the models they were using. Remember Reagan's thing, the the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. I think the eight most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm Jared Kushner and I'm here to help. <laughs> Well, you know, Donald Trump has actually made the Reagan line kind of true, right? He himself, anyway, this is dangerous to the American people. He gets up and he offers medical advice. Take this drug. People are dying because he said, take this drug. You know, they, I don't know if you, there was a couple in Arizona who went and took the drug and died. There are people who need the drug for other things. I think it wasn't it part of some fish. Yeah, thing fish, put tank. In a fish tank. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. It's not, that's not totally on him. That's on a little on the couple, and I hate to be rough. I'm with you on that. But, okay. But as a general rule, when doctors are skeptical of a drug as useful in a particular illness, the president shouldn't be getting up at a press conference telling everybody to take it. And he shouldn't be cutting Fauci off when he's asked about it. You know, one of the patterns in the Trump administration and Jared being – in any way involved in the response to the pandemic is an illustration of it, is that, you know, because Trump 
only appointed people who he was sure were totally loyal to him, irrespective of their qualifications for whatever job he was giving them. There were lots and lots of people, an extraordinary number of people, and this happens in any administration, but in this administration it was off the charts, an extraordinary number of people who were totally ill-suited for the jobs they were given. What surprised me, if I'm a person like, I don't know, Rick Perry, who has called for the abolishment of the Energy Department without knowing anything about what goes on inside the Energy Department, and then Donald Trump offers me the chance to run the Energy Department. I think my response, if he offers me that, is to say, no, as a patriotic American, I can't do that because not only do I really not know anything about it, I've shown everybody I don't know anything about it. It's, it would be an embarrassment. And if Jared Kushner has offered the chance to run some sort of pandemic response unit, the thing he should do is say, I, I don't know. You know, there are other people who know. I would understand Trump is a basically kind of insane in some way, and he will he will offer people these jobs. I'm just amazed how many people take the jobs because these are people who are not completely insane. And th- you would think they'd say, look, daddy, daddy-in-law, uh, pops, um, there are other things I could do. Put me in charge of, I don't know, uh, rebuilding the ranger huts in in national parks. I know building. Uh, but don't don't make me the head of the pandemic response. Does team. he really know buildings? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He, he knows something, right? Put me in charge of the slim suit acquisition policy. Uh, it, it, there's something he knows or something he's qualified for. I mean, in your life, people must have come to you and they've come to me offering me jobs that I knew I just had no business taking. And I just said, no, right? I mean, yeah, right. Well, you, you don't want one. You know what you're capable of and what you're not. And uh, you don't want to embarrass yourself. That's by, the big thing. You don't want to embarrass you know, yourself. Yeah. Or I don't kill people. It. Or kill or, a lot of people. There's secondarily. That. Secondarily. There's <laughs> that. But, and that's but, embarrassing. That is embarrassing. embarrassing killing Uh, being responsible for the deaths of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. But Trump doesn't seem to be embarrassed. No. Um, I mean, that's a peculiar mind at work. I mean, people want to put words, a word to it, but it really is, it's really worth describing what's going on in there. The, The business of telling a story after the fact and that being the only thing that matters. So he's looking constantly for that material rather than whatever the reality is. How can reality be distorted in a plausible enough way? And it's all on display, and we all have to see it. Now that he's got the two-hour press conference, that's like 10 hours a week just on stage. So if you wa- <laughs> I, 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 have not, I have not watched one minute of those press conferences, and I suppose you have. It, it's, I shouldn't, but it's like watching, not watching a train wreck, it's it's uh, much more interesting than that. I I find it fascinating how sick he is. I actually had an idea. I was going to write something about. It. I was going to watch them all back to back, starting back you know in early January. I'm just curious if you've noticed differences in his demeanor as we've witnessed the descent. Well, he wasn't doing them in January. In January, he was just every once in a while being quoted saying uh, it's under control. There's right. only 11 but, uh, people, but now it's five. Or it's only one. It's one uh, guy from China that was at that point. Or anyone who wants a test can get a test, and the tests are perfect. I, you know, I've been reading a lot about how all this went awry. One of the, uh, my favorite things is Azar coming to him, and he told associates that the president said he was alarmist. This is early, fairly early on. And that the president, was, mine was really on, was flavored vaping. Yes. He was wondering when the flavored vaping would start again. Right. That's what he wanted. Right. Because Someone- Gottlieb, and I think that's why Gottlieb left the FDA, because of vaping. And why, why, why would anyone before flavored vaping <laughs> well, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and actually care about it? The short answer is some financial interest got to him, right? Uh, I mean, that's what happens is someone who's got a flavored vaping company. Gee, I wonder who that could be. Someone from Juul calls him. What's more curious is why get rid of the pandemic response unit in the NSC? Because there's nobody, there's no pro-pandemic business interest. 
I mean, maybe there is, you know, maybe some people will benefit, but nobody's thinking that way. There's no one in his ear saying, uh, let, let's get let's let's get rid of this safeguard uh, so we can have a pandemic ha- happen so we can make lots of money. So you can't explain that act of mismanagement in the same way you can explain the interest in flavored vaping product. That's why he denied it for two months is that he just didn't want it to be real. And, and there, you know, he wanted to do various things, and Mnuchin was against them because they would hurt the economy. And a lot of the reason I think he was saying it's going to be fine was he thought if he told the truth that it would hurt the economy, <laughs> it would hurt the stock market. That's right. He was playing the stock market for a while. How did that it, work out? It, it hasn't worked out so well. Yeah, but you know, you never, you know what I wonder? I wonder how many people have privileged information to which way he's going to jump from moment to moment and are using it to trade the stock market because it's really not that hard to do. If he comes out and tweets, I got a deal between Russia and Saudi Arabia and we're going to sort out these oil prices, you know what's going to happen in the stock market. You buy some, you, you buy some, you know, call options on all the oil companies and you make a fortune. Oh, you know, I want to ask you about (laughs) is that he keeps going like, well, the cupboard was bare. (laughs) You know, he says that thing. And first of all, I think he hasn't he been president for three years. Yes, he's been president for three years. Don't you if you've noticed that the cupboards are bare, don't you fill them? And, And were they bare? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, we know there was a blueprint for how to deal with exactly this sort of virus. And we know that local leaders eventually internalized this and took the lead on responding to it. And we know that he ignored it. Uh, we know that he made a big mistake in thinking that his his Center for Disease Control had a test for it when they didn't. We know that he made a probably a really big mistake in eliminating a program, two hundred million dollar program, that was designed to predict outbreaks in foreign countries, particularly animals. This is food. under the CDC. Uh, pre- the predict program, I think, was in the Health and Human Services uh, Department. But okay, I could be but he wrong. cut CDC funding. He cut CDC. He's not the only one who did that, but yes, he cut he cut CDC funding. But the prediction program, I mean, in a different world. We would have never seen this virus. It it was designed specifically to like be there when the first Chinese person got got the virus and see how deadly it was going to be or how easily it was transmitted and how hard it was contained and help the Chinese government contain it on the spot. That's the other side of this thing is I've not seen anybody. I'm sure someone will unravel the trouble that was caused by Trump's inability to communicate with honestly with the Chinese leaders. I mean, he he was complimenting she during this period, right? And when they were withholding all this, I mean, they wouldn't give us the virus so we could make the tests. I mean, a lot of this is on them. Yes, but it's partly on us to know they're lying to us, right? That's knowable. Not that hard to know, actually, because you've got evidence that the thing is much worse than they're saying. In fact, there were people, there were Americans who were in there on the ground who had good information and it just never got to the White House. You know, back to your original question about is he the right leader for the moment? I can't think of anybody who's the would be a worse leader for the moment. Can I ask you a couple questions? If yeah. you were if you were president, how would you mm-hmm. be handling it? Right now, never mind what, what was done. Let's just forget about all this. I, I put you in there right now. What do you do? Well, I'd use all my authority, I would uh, get all these corporations who can make things, make them. Okay. That's a good make start. What we, what, make what we need. I would do everything I, I could to get the testing up. I mean, the fact that the disaster here was our failure to get a test, and uh, we still i have only tested a little over a million people as of when we're recording this, which is absurd. So I would be, and I don't know how to do that, but I think I would ask people who do know how. I certainly would not have uh, these press conferences. I would have people like Fauci and Burks 
in, informing people. I, I I think that just those those press conferences have created a tremendous amount of harm. And uh, you'd have the you'd, I, ha- you'd have the press conferences. You just wouldn't be there. Yeah, no, I wouldn't be there. And uh, but what I'm saying is, I think that people don't have confidence in him. I don't know how you could have confidence in him. So maybe I would give an address every once in a while. I mean, FDR would do the fireside chats on radio, but he would space them out by months, and he'd work on them. He'd work on them. He'd spend days writing them. And I w- and he he rallied people and he inspired people. Would you get out in front of this shelter in place idea and say, and say to the governors who still aren't doing it, you got to do it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, that costs lives not doing that. Now, we, that does cost lives, not not doing it. Um, how would you respond to all the people who were screaming at you that you were overreacting and you're destroying the economy? I would say um, just look at what's happening. And you're, I'm, you can see that I'm not overreacting. That you I don't think we'd be, we wouldn't be in the, in the, the horrific nightmare that we're in we were going to have a pandemic no matter what but now we have an out of control pandemic because of this president and because of his leadership style that you wrote about in the fifth risk i mean there there is a story you tell about him with christie chris christie who led the transition uh, up to until he won, and then he fired him on Jared's insistence. But he said to Christie, "Tell me if I got this right." He said to Christie, "You and I could take an hour away from the victory party and plan the government." Yes, and is he that said, about and right? He said, "You and I would take an hour from the victory party and learn everything we need to know about the government." that we don't need all these people to go in and figure out what the government's doing. I um, think that says a whole bunch. Mhm. <laughs> yeah, about what's happened. This is so tragic. I don't I don't know if you're watching what I'm watching. I mean, I I don't know why I do this to myself. I watched a couple of specials, one on CNN and one on MSNBC. On on one was on the emergency room emergency room in Brooklyn, and one was emergency room in Italy. It it's horrifying. These doctors and nurses are they are heroes, but it's like it's worse than war. I think we should never have put them in this position, and uh, and with they should have the protect. I mean, how can you send them there without? masks and and what's happening is is that you know when this started they would do what you're supposed to do which was replace your mask after each patient now they're making the masks last all day and then they're putting their masks in paper bags and these people are risking their lives yet no the the trick, the management trick in Trump's mind that leads him to say that kind of thing to Christie, it's never going to be my responsibility. He's basically saying anything that goes wrong is someone else's fault, always. So I don't. he never took responsibility for the government. You know, I, we never talked about this, mm-hmm. but I, the, a question I wished you to ask me is how on earth did you end up writing this book in the first place? Because it was a weird, it was a weird book to write, right? Who wants to read about the federal government? I, it's not nothing. It's like nothing I've ever written before. It is not sexy. Do you want me to ask it? No, how did right. you come to write this book in the first place? 
the Lionel. day he, the day he walked up the White House steps. See, I knew something about this dude. I'd read the stupid books he'd written and reviewed them. I'd watched him in New York, and I watched how anybody who had anything to do with him thought very little of him. You know, I had a, a, some sense of who he was. And uh, as he was walking up the White House steps, remember when the Obamas are waiting to let him into the greet him and hand him the keys of the White House? I was in bed having recovering from a surgery, and I had opioids in me, and I hated them. I mean, I just, like, I was vomiting, and I just didn't, I was in a miserable state of mind. And the thought that crossed my mind was, how is he going to kill me? I feel this existential dread, the risk that I feel there's a risk in my life that did not exist before. And I don't understand why everybody's not feeling that. And I also thought at the same time, what point is there to me saying or writing anything about this because all the people who I would like to hear it will just ignore it, his supporters. Nobody's speaking to anybody else. So I thought the way to express this is not with a book. First thing I wasn't going to do was write a book. The first thing I thought was we will make a calculation, a running calculation of the number of Americans, never mind the foreigners, but the number of Americans who die because Donald Trump was president. We'll have some statisticians come in and say, well, so-and-so many people would have died uh, with Obamacare, and now he's getting rid of it. So-and-so, you know, we, we would actually, we'd have some intellectually respectable exercise. And I thought, what we'll do is we'll get that number and we'll create the Trump death clock that we'll put in Times Square, and it will scroll. And so you're in bed with on opioids at this point. Yeah, I'm just sitting there drugged up. It's an insane idea. It's, <laughs> okay. it's you know, it's an insane idea. But uh, I was thinking of the debt clock. You remember the old debt clock that used yes. to? Yes. Yeah. Then and there's I, the nuclear clock too. Yeah, it gets people. How watch, close gets, to midnight we are. Gets people. Yeah, it gets people's attention. And I thought it'll scroll, and there'll be little stories of people whose lives were lost because Donald Trump mismanaged the government, and. I still was kind of a little zonked out for about a week. And in that week, I hobbled into the office of Tom Steyer and said, would you pay for this? And he said, it's a great idea. Figure out how to do it and we'll do it. And I then sat down with really smart people and uh, who could do the stats. And they said, you know, there's just no way to do this. Uh, you, it's never going to be really intellectually respectable. So I gave up and wrote the book. But right now... You could put the death clock up and it would be intellectually respectable. You could calculate how many Americans die because of his response to this by comparing it to a country where they managed the thing properly. Like South Korea. Or... Yeah. Uh, the, the, I talked today. I told uh, a, a really great writer for The New York Times. I won't say who he is because um, you'll understand. So I said I was interviewing you. And he said, I've always been jealous of Michael Lewis. How did he think of writing The Fifth Risk? He always does this. He did it with Moneyball. He did it with Big Short, Liar's Poker. He, he always does this. And so you, I mean, that's why I said, do you have enough material for the paperback? I didn't realize <laughs> that the paperback was out. But you, like, hit a vein here. That is, uh, is the insight into this. The fifth risk is a. It's just appalling. The the clock wouldn't have made sense until this. Yes, that's true. Because he hasn't sent us to war. We've got to give him credit for that. He's, yep. uh, you know, uh, eleven thousand Kurds died. You know instead of us, because they fought ISIS, and then he just completely abandoned them. And so now we'll never be able to get allies again. Our place in the world, and we are not, you know, we're supposed to be the essential nation. The world seems to be unraveling in the way this was handled, don't you think? Our place in the world has been unraveling for a bit. The financial crisis didn't help either. We sort of exported a lot of that. But he is, he's not been good for our place in the world. But he didn't care about that either, right? I would have thought when you were sitting in the Senate that you would see instantly the risks he poses to the society because you are budgeting the federal government. You're seeing where the money's going and where he doesn't want to give money. I would have thought there'd be no one in Congress who 
was not alive to the, the sort of risks he was presenting to the society, no? What I was watching was the Republican Party being the Republican Party and try to dismantle the ACA, which would cost a lot of lives. There's been an assault on it, and a number of people covered under has has gone down. I saw them suddenly not care about the deficit. When there's a Democratic president, the Republicans in Congress, just they really care about the deficit and the debt. But as soon as a Republican becomes president, they cut taxes. They cut taxes. They forget in a way all about. You, they forget all about the deficit. Completely. Yeah. Completely. And you know, I was on the floor saying to the managers, the Republican managers, of that bill, you know, this is going to cause like a trillion dollars increase in the national debt. No, it won't. Um, they, you know, increase economic activity. It'll pay for itself. I go, no, it never does. It never does. You know it. You know it. You guys are just dishonest. <laughs> Those aren't the ones that are that I said earlier in this that were my friends. Right. <laughs> Those are the people that piss me off and I just Did you, you ever know. did you ever almost get into a fight? No. Never got that way. I'd have thought no. it would, I would thought it would get that way. I mean, you know, it's not that I haven't fantasize <laughs> beating the shit out of them <laughs> it's just uh, uh no i've never been in a fight and i've stood up to people i've put myself in situations where someone was doing something that he needed to be confronted and i i wrestled and i just felt stupidly maybe that as long as a guy doesn't have a gun or a knife i'm in good shape you know but no, I never. And it never. I really, wait, am it, I sound like I'm bragging? I think I am. That's bad. That's bad. I led you to this, so it's totally, it's totally okay that you. Yeah, you said that's this. what I'll say. No, no, no. It's totally that's okay. That's what I'll this. say. I'll no, include it now. You include it. Yeah, it was my question, <laughs> but I, I would have thought, given the stakes, I would have thought things would get very hot in the Senate. I would have thought there would be more, almost fights. I uh, yelled. Remember Simpson Bowles, and they were mm-hmm. going to try to yep. bring down the deficit and by you know cutting Social Security, doing all kinds of things, right? And we're in a meeting, a bipartisan meeting, and at a certain point, I just exploded. And I said, you guys don't really care about this at all. You want the economy to tank. Because you want to be Obama, and you—I mean, I just went off on on everybody. I got reprimanded by uh, the Democrat who was running that bipartisan group, but I—I I just had enough. But I would never, you know, I would cane someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I first got to the Senate, right? I. I um, I just said, I, I get told this is as bad as it gets. It's n- never been worse. And I said, never? And then Carl Levin said, well, actually, it was worse once. And I said, when? And he said, 1856. And I said, Sumner getting caned? And he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? I mean, it is funny. I, I, I just don't. And I'm he was always, serious. It was like, no, it's been worse. I mean, just given how quickly Americans default to violence, uh, it's just surprising to me there isn't more violence in places where it really matters, like the Senate. Uh, I mean, I'd have thought it would just get hostile very quickly over these things uh, because because so many. Not in the Senate. No. <laughs> in the House. Sorry. In the, even in they the House. Co- they would come to fisticuffs. <laughs> In the House, but not in the Senate, but the e- upper house. But even in the even in the House, they don't do that anymore. Uh, I think there. I think while I've been there, there were a couple. Oh, really? Yeah, there were a couple altercations that didn't get out of hand, but there were a couple. Almost fights. Like I can't that. remember. No, no, no. I think there were like some shoving and stuff. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But not a flat out fight. Right. 
How do we get in the? Fight I don't know. Board? I'm sorry. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I I'm sorry. I just the. Uh, so what? Do you know any specifics? I mean, there are all these articles about moments where the ball was real, just dropped. <laughs> and uh, do, do you know any from your research? That... Do, do I have any scoop? So no, I don't have any scoop on pand on pandemics. I tell you, I I I left the the CDC. Well, then why are you here? I asked you this very question. <laughs> I asked you this very question. It's your fault. Uh, the CDC and the Health and Human Services ended up on my cutting room floor because I thought it was too obvious. I thought there's no of of all the risks not to mismanage. I thought pandemic was about the, <laughs> was about the top, and I tell you why I thought that. In addition to you know, it's it's almost happened a bunch in the last fifteen years, so it's kind of on on, on people's mind a bit. When I was uh, writing about Obama, I spent six months with Obama at the end of his first term writing a big profile, and I asked him, like, what keeps you up at night? And the first thing he said was pandemic. So I just thought this is not something the government, that they're going to underinvest in. I I thought, you know, this is, it's it's just not, that's not the place to look because the premise of my book was, it's the it's the risk you're not thinking of. And, and, and lo and behold, pandemic became one of the risks that the Trump administration wasn't thinking of. Well, I, you know... Still, I think your take on this was so prescient that um, I knew that this would be a fun interview. How's that? All right. All right. Well, good talking to you. Thanks for having me, Michael. Well, I I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week.